One of the privileges of my youth uh, was having been born an only child, uh, living in a home where my dad went out of town to work through the week quite a lot, and my mother never drove. So when I turned 16, I got my 365, my learner's permit, on my birthday, and I took some driver's education, and I got my driver's license as soon as I possibly could, and in the middle of that process, my dad bought a second vehicle, a 1977 Plymouth Volare in deep green, 225 slant six engine, indestructible. Fenders, not so much. I think by the time we were done with that car, and by then I was well into my university years, I think there might have been more Bondo in that car than there was uh, steel. Anyway. Uh, Nowadays, it would be a pretty expensive undertaking, but when I was a kid, I had the privilege of relatively cheap insurance premiums because it was my dad's car, and in those days, he could be primary driver on both vehicles in Northern Ontario. And so I, as a male, new driver under 25, had reasonable rates assigned to me because I was the child of a driver with a near-perfect driving record. I was able to scoot in on the cheap with the co-operators on the coattails of my father's good driving record. When I turned 25, though, and was not living in the north, but living in southern Ontario, I learned what real car insurance rates could be like. And this scenario could be reenacted in any number of circumstances. I remember about 16 years ago going to buy a used car and I went to a dealership on the recommendation of a friend, and he said, speak to this guy and tell him I sent you. So I spoke to that guy and told him who sent me, and the vehicle I wanted, all of a sudden, the price dropped. I had gotten a better deal on the coattails of my friend. Well, what's all this got to do with faith? Well, sadly, some people treat faith in the same way. They, they use the coattail method, and we're gonna to learn today that it doesn't really work that way. When we fill in our census forms, uh, some people will say they are, for example, Presbyterian, even though they have never set foot in a Presbyterian church in their entire lives. But when they get their census forms, they mark Presbyterian on there because they think, my grandmother was a Presbyterian. And now how that happens less and less nowadays than it used to. I think because having a particular religious affiliation is not seen to be as necessary as it once was. And as a result, we have seen the increase in what sociologists of religion call nuns, N-O-N-E-S, that is, uh, people who claim no religious affiliation on all their census forms. In fact, that's the grow fastest growing religious segment in Canada today is the nuns, N-O-N-E-S. Uh, according to Reg Bibby. And actually, I, I must admit, I find that honesty kind of refreshing. It's more realistic and less hypocritical to say that your religion is none than to say that you belong to one faith group or another when, in fact, you don't actually practice it at all. But we still have some. Indeed, there are some who even go to church who say they are affiliated with a particular group, even though their hearts reflect something different. In our walk through the book of Romans, we've seen the Apostle Paul take aim at pagan Gentiles for their way of life, uh, and we've seen demonstrated for us that whether one is Jewish or Gentile, we can't obey the law well enough to garner our own salvation. So we're called upon to accept God's gracious alternative and live by faith. And as we get into the second part of chapter 2, we see that Paul is taking aim at the followers of Jesus who are of Jewish background. Now, essentially, two main characteristics make someone Jewish. One is the law, and the other is circumcision. The law was given specifically to the Jews as God's chosen people in the Old Testament, and the sign of the covenant with them was that all males would be circumcised on the eighth day of their lives. The Jews prized these hallmarks of their chosenness, but as the Roman Empire closed in, it, the Jews were finding, generally, that they wanted to assimilate and become more like the Romans. 
So some Jews started to shy away from circumcision. During the Maccabean Revolt, and uh, you can learn about the Maccabean Revolt in the books of the Apocrypha, the books of Maccabees, that's the uh, deuterocanonical books that show up between the Old and New Testaments in Roman Catholic Bibles. Interesting history to read. Not the Word of God, but interesting history. Uh, and the Maccabean Revolt took place in the second century BC, and uh, in part of what they were doing was bringing about a resurgence of the importance of circumcision by zealous Jews who wanted to maintain their culture. Uh, an analogy to think about with that would be Bill 101 in Quebec when that was introduced in the 1970s. The idea behind it was to preserve the unique Quebecois culture by preserving the French language. And so a law was enacted that made French uh, the primary language of the province of Quebec. Of course, a lot more complicated than that, but that's not where we're going today. The idea, though, was to say that uh, as the Quebecois wanted to preserve French language to preserve their culture, so the Maccabees wanted to preserve circumcision as a preservation of Jewish culture in a time when it was being uh, watered down to a certain extent. So by the time Paul is writing the, to the Romans around 200 years later, most people of Jewish backgrounds held circumcision in very high esteem, thinking that it was a distinctive, perhaps made them even a superior people that they were chosen by God. So as Paul writes in the latter part of Romans 2, he goes hard after his own people about how they revere the law and cherish circumcision, but may not be living out what they revere and cherish to the extent that they could. All right, we're going to read Romans 2, 17 through 29. We'll take a few breaks here and there. You who call yourselves Jews are relying on God's law, and you boast about your special relationship with him. You know what he wants. You know what is right because you've been taught the law. You are convinced that you are a guide for the blind and a light for the people who are lost in darkness. You think you can instruct the ignorant and teach children the ways of God, for you are certain that God's law gives you complete knowledge and truth. Now, in this section, Paul lists off the blessings of being Jewish, and he writes from experience, of course, because he is Jewish by background. First, there's the very name Jew. They were called Jews first back in 2 Kings in the Old Testament to refer to the descendants of Judah, one of Jacob's sons. And it's a term that's been used to refer to the chosen people of God ever since. They say they rely on the law. They say they boast about their relationship with God. They know what God wants in his law. They see themselves as a guide for the blind and a light in the darkness. Though by the time of Jesus, that might have just been taken a little too much for granted. Because in Matthew 15, 14, Jesus called the Pharisees blind guides. And they also see themselves as instructors of the ignorant and teachers of children, by which they would mean the Gentiles. So Paul knows how Jewish people, even Jewish followers of Jesus, see themselves in this Roman setting. And literature of the day demonstrates that this was a typical Jewish attitude. But he has a word or two for them. So we go on, verse 21. Well then, if you teach others, why don't you teach yourself? You tell others not to steal, but do you steal? You say it's wrong to commit adultery, but do you commit adultery? You condemn idolatry, but do you use items stolen from pagan temples? You are so proud of knowing the law, but you dishonor God by breaking it. No wonder the scriptures say the Gentiles blaspheme the name of God because of you. Now, these are some extreme examples, of course, not characteristic of most faithful Jews of the time. Paul quotes Isaiah 52, verse 5, which we read earlier to underscore that the way you act can cause unbelievers to stumble. Yet, that all have natural revelation. All people have. Indeed, they see God's hand in the natural world, and 
The Jews claim to have special revelation from God in the law, so in a double sense, they have no excuse. Yet they're not living what they profess. They have a coattail faith. Stuart Briscoe, the British-American preacher, tells a story in his commentary on Romans about when he was young and working in a bank, there was one of his fellow employees who was caught embezzling funds, and so he was fired and charged. And as he was being led out of the bank, he uh, said this, I am very sorry for what I have done, and I need to know whether I should fulfill my preaching commitments on Sunday in our local church. Well, Briscoe, at that point, was he was a Christian, and he shuddered at the response that followed because many people in the bank began to assume that all Christians are hypocrites and that the gospel has no significance because of what this man had done and had said. What we believe matters, but so does how we act on what we believe. Verse 25. The Jewish ceremony of circumcision has value only if you obey God's law. But if you don't obey God's law, you are no better off than an uncircumcised Gentile. And if the Gentiles obey God's law, won't God declare them to be his own people? In fact, uncircumcised Gentiles who keep God's law will condemn you Jews who are circumcised and possess God's law, but don't obey it. Now, Paul is speaking hypothetically here because remember in Romans 3, verse 20, it says, For no one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. The law simply shows us how sinful we are. Verse 28. For you are not a true Jew just because you were born of Jewish parents or because you have gone through the ceremony of circumcision. No, a true Jew is one whose heart is right with God. What matters most, he says, is the heart. Jeremiah 4.4 4 says, Circumcise yourselves to the Lord and take away the foreskins of your hearts. The inner life matters more than the outward. Paul continues, And true, true, true circumcision is not merely obeying the letter of the law. Rather, it is a change of heart produced by the Spirit. It's not the letter of the law that matters, but the spirit. Paul will contrast these again and again throughout his writings. And finally, he says, And a person with a changed heart seeks praise from God, not from people. Now, there are those who will suggest that this passage is full of anti-Semitism. But that is not Paul's intent. After all, he was born a Jew and only came to Christ through the conversion experience that was very well documented by Luke in Acts chapter 9. No, Paul is not an anti-Semite. At this point, though, don't, don't miss the, the difference here. He may be seen to be anti-Judaism. That is, he's not hating a race of people, not least his own. He believes that the Jewish religion, though, is not a valid expression of of the truth. That's not being anti-Semitic any more than believing that Islam is not the true way is anti-Arab or that believing Hinduism is not the true way is anti-Indian. The point that Paul makes here and in other parts he writes in the New Testament is that it's not the law itself nor circumcision that makes them right with God. It's the practice of how they live that out. As he says in verse 29, a true Jew is one whose heart is right with God. One is not a true Jew just because one is born to Jewish parents. And by application, we can say the same of the true follower of Jesus. She or he is one whose heart is right with God. One is not a true follower of Jesus just because one is born to Christian parents. Let me say that last part again. One is not a true Christian, a true follower of Jesus, just because one is born to Christian parents. You can't get in on your parents or your grandparents or anybody else's coattails. I, I was fond of the way Briscoe dealt with this passage in his commentary, and he had a couple of headings that I really liked, so I'm going to 
borrow his headings. And the first of those is that coattail faith is characterized by profession without performance. Profession without performance. In other words, you've got to walk your talk. If you say you're a follower of Jesus, whether you call it that or refer it to by some denomination or another, you're not actually practicing your faith. You're not really what you say you are. Think of it this way. If I'm on a plane and someone says, is there a doctor on board? I could respond by saying yes, but the likelihood is that they're looking for a doctor of medicine and not a doctor of ministry at that point. I can't pretend to be something that I'm not. Or if my friend has a problem with milking his cows, even though my grandfather was a farmer, I am in no position to offer any advice on that matter. Why should it be, be any different when it comes to matters of faith? Profession without performance is called pretending. The other heading that Briscoe uses about what I'm calling coattail faith is ritual without reality. We might call this going through the motions. Let's say the pastor's wife comes to church every Sunday but sits in the front pew and reads the newspaper during the sermon. That sounds preposterous, but it's actually a true story. Let me be clear, it's not happening right now. My wife, if I could turn the camera, you would see that she is busy operating this system and making sure that the camera does what it needs to do. It's, it, it's not a story from here, <laughs> but it is a true story. It sounds preposterous, but it's a crummy witness for the faith, and it would be distracting to people in the congregation that actually wanted to worship God and listen to the message. But when we show up at church and just sit there like a bump on a log, or maybe stand when everybody else stands, or bow our heads and everybody else bows their heads, but in no way engage with what's going on around us, we're just going through the motions. We're physically present, but we're not mentally or emotionally present. Now, no church in its right mind would ever say that people like that shouldn't be allowed to come to worship, because who knows but that the Holy Spirit might grab hold of someone in a context like that and convict them to come to faith. That's why worship gatherings are public worship gatherings, except right now, uh, in person. But that's why we put these broadcasts up in public, so that anybody can engage. So Paul's reaction to the claims of the Jewish believers in the Roman church is that they're doing the same things that they scoffed at the Gentiles for doing. And so they are subject to God's wrath. Their blessings do not rescue them from judgment. Their blessings must be responded to with obedience. Now these blessings are theirs, Paul says, but they don't live up to their claims. All right, we need to apply this in our own context. There was a time in the church, and in some places and traditions it still exists, where every family in a mainline church presented their children for baptism. Why did they do that? Because it was socially and culturally expected. In some traditions, if you don't get your baby baptized, you run the risk of your baby going to hell or some unbiblical place called limbo. But how much of that is cultural and how much of that is faith-driven? We rejoice with families that present their children for baptism in faith with a desire to fulfill the vows of having a Christ-centered home where the children are raised to love and know and serve Jesus Christ. But our hearts, and I think God's heart, are saddened when children are presented for baptism solely because if they don't do it, somebody's going to get written out of the will. And I think because culture does not place as much pressure on families as it used to for religious rituals that mean nothing to them, we are seeing fewer baptisms of babies, but even in mainline churches, more baptisms of adults as they come to faith in Christ than people who've never been baptized before. And that's okay. While our tradition enshrines the number of baptisms in statistics, I think a more accurate representation of the growth of the church would be true professions of faith as a sign of health. Even baptism, though, can be deceiving. 
Because if we ride through life assuming everything's going to be tickety-boo when we get to the pearly gates because we've been baptized at any point in our lives, we have not lived out our faith, have not walked our talk. We're just skating on thin ice because we are espousing coattail faith. And as Paul tells the Romans, that's not the way it works. In fact, he goes a step further in verse 29 when he says, No, a true Jew is one whose heart is right with God. And true circumcision is not merely obeying the letter of the law. Rather, it is a change of heart produced by the Spirit. What he's saying here is that a true change of heart comes only by the power of the Holy Spirit at work in our lives. Only those with the Holy Spirit are the true people of God, whether of Jewish background or Gentile background or whatever background, it doesn't matter. Now, this becomes a point of division too, because some traditions have particular beliefs about what constitutes the presence of the Holy Spirit in a believer's life. But while some will say that you need to speak in tongues to prove that you have the Holy Spirit, the Bible actually says something quite different. Paul, the same Paul who speaks favorably about the gift of speaking in tongues, also says in Galatians 5 that people who have the Holy Spirit living in them are people who bear the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. If someone is walking the talk, they're going to be demonstrating these signs of the Holy Spirit's presence in their lives. If someone is not demonstrating those signs, they're espousing coattail faith. Now, where are you at in the midst of all this today? It's time for a gut check. I want to ask yourself these questions. Do I truly believe that Jesus Christ is my Savior and Lord? Now, if you're still listening and you're one who believes Jesus is your Savior and Lord, then type Lord in the comments. And do I also bear the fruit of the Spirit? That is, am I growing in love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control? If you're growing in this area, you don't have to be perfect, right? Because none of us is perfect. But if you're growing in this area, type spirit in the comments. And, and, see these all go together. Am I putting in effort into spiritual disciplines? Again, you don't have to be perfect. None of us is perfect. But if you're working at having a prayer life, if you're working at reading the Bible regularly, if you're working at deepening your walk with God, then type disciplines in the comments. See, you can be working on disciplines alone and be a faithless mystic. You can be working at bearing the fruit of the Spirit alone and just be a moral person. And you can name Jesus as Lord, but if you're not also working on disciplines and bearing the fruit of the Spirit, then you too might be espousing coattail faith. You can't have one without the other two. We need them all if we are to be growing as followers of Jesus and seeking to build his kingdom. Let me close where I started. If I walked into an insurance office today and sought to get insurance for my car, but could only present my dad's driving record, they would usher me out faster than you could say actuarial science. I have to own up to who I really am and what I really do as a driver in order to get the insurance coverage that I need. And when we stand before God, we need to own up to who we really are to know that we are cloaked in the righteousness of Jesus and we need to be honest about how we have lived out our faith in order to be men and women and children who live to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Let's pray. Father, thank you for Jesus who died and rose again to save us from sin and grant us eternal life and who ascended to your right hand so that he can pray for us even now. And thank you for the words of Paul who reminds us that we can't expect to meet you on good terms solely by the faith of others, but only by our own faith. Fill us with your Holy Spirit who equips us to be all that we can be in Christ Jesus our Lord and quicken our hearts 
to encourage those we know who may be thinking that they are in good standing with you, even though they are espousing coattail faith. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd love to know that you've been with us today, especially if for the first time, so please go to stpaulsnobleton.ca slash connect and fill out our online connection card so I can thank you for being with us and follow up with any need you may have. 